we talked about the fact that during this um, entire process, you had the opportunity to review your statement. Um, you made a few changes and you've signed the statement. Is that correct? I'm yet to sign it. You're yet to sign it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. But you did make some changes this morning. Indeed. And so we have at least the printed copy where you made those changes. And we will endeavor to make sure that you sign it um, during the break. During your testimony, um, a few rules that you should be aware of. There's interpretation going on into the local languages. Therefore, I will ask that you speak slowly. I will do the same. And to allow a few seconds in between um, our speeches to ensure that there's no overlapping speech. Well noted. And you can leave your microphone on um, so that you don't have to keep switching it on and off. Um, but I'm quite used to having to turn mine on and off, so that's fine. Um, if at any point you do not understand any of my questions or you would like me to repeat a question or clarify it, just let me know and I will do so. As we discuss, um, your testimony today will focus a lot on the April 10 and 11, 2000, the incident. But prior to that, as we do with all witnesses, I will ask you some background questions. It is your first testimony before the commission, mm -hmm. so the commissioners um, would like to know who you are. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you a few biographical de um, details, a bit about your educational background, and then your career um, as a civil servant. Then we will um, address your victimization, and then we will focus on the April um, 2000 incident. For a lot of that incident, it will be obviously in your capacity um, and the role you had at the time, as well as what you observed as um, a direct witness. And um, that should conclude your testimony for today. Do you understand that, sir? I did. So we'll start your testimony. Um, can you please state for the record your full name? My full name is Usman Baji. Mr. Baji, can you tell us when and where you were born? I was born in Banjul on the 2nd of August 1967. What is your current profession? My current profession, I'm a project coordinator. Um, who do you work for as project coordinator? I'm working with some a Senegalese partner in a project in Casamance. Can you tell us briefly about your educational background? And we're really interested in where you attended school as well as the years that you um, pursued your education to the extent that you recall. I did my primary education at the Senegalese primary school in Banjul from 1974 to 1980. That same year I passed the common entrance and I was supposed to be posted to the high school in Kaulak. Luckily for me, that same year the Senegalese government offered two places for Gambians in the military high school in St. Louis. We sat to the entry exam. I was among the two who were successful and I decided to go to the military high school. We were there from uh, 1980 to 88 when I sat to the baccalaureate A-level, came back home to serve my country as agreed with the Ministry of Defense. I joined the gendarmerie the same year, 1988, in July, and October of the same year, we went to the military academy in chess called Ecole Nationale des Officiers d'Active. I was with uh, retired Colonel Dembangai, former chief of protocol, commissioner of police Alassane Kuyate. 
We did two years course and graduated in July 1990 as second lieutenant. We came back home and went to our unit, the Gambia National Gendarmerie. In 1991, I was lucky to be part of the first Gambian batch that went to Turkey with some of our senior officers, Ibrahim Malik Chongan, uh, Suare, Captain Amadou Suare, and some of our junior officers as well, like uh, Musambu, Lantom Bontamba, late Harry Valentine, late Sadibu Haidara, and many others. We attended the Turkish Land Forces Language School in Istanbul for eight months. After, completion the after completing the language course, the rest of the group went to Ankara for their gendarmerie professional course. Myself, Alaji Martin, then he was a sergeant, and uh, Corporal Alaji Jaina, we went to Focha in Izmir for a gendarmerie commando course. We finished the course after four months training and returned back home to Banjul, where upon arrival, we were posted to the Turkish Gendarmerie Training School under Major Karaduman. At this point, did your rank change upon your arrival um, from Turkey, or did you continue to remain a second lieutenant? I remain a second lieutenant, but I, if you excuse me, can I refer to the, the promotion? Yes, you may. Yes, I remain a second lieutenant until 1st of January 1992 when I was promoted to lieutenant. And I was asked to train the first Gambian commando batch with the assistance of Alaji Martin and uh, Corporal Jaina. We did the training at the training school for four months. We graduated the bag, presided over by late president, peace be upon him, Sardaura Jawara at the Fajara Barracks. After that training, the boys, some of them were posted at the state house as presidential guard officials. After that, did you go abroad for any other training, military yes. training? Yes, I did. But prior to going, I started the second badge of commando training um, after one month. I had to travel to Morocco from September 1993 to July 1994 for my gendarmerie officer's course. Upon completing the course, I returned home in July on the 15th of July 1994 and apply for my leave. I left Banjul on a Wednesday, I think it was on the 20th, to Dakar. Thursday, Friday, the coup d'etat of 1994 happened. As it is customary in the military, if such thing happens in your absence and you are an officer, you have to contact your unit and see what the situation is, which I did. But those two days, I could not get anybody because the communication was cut off until Sunday, 
when I called the Fajara barracks and I was lucky to have on the line Lieutenant Lantombon Tamba who said, so where are you? I said, but you know that I'm on leave and because of what I had on RFI, that's why I'm calling to find out what the situation is. But I did not run my way. I left a car that same day and came to Banjul. On Monday, I reported to the Fajara barracks. And uh, I was informed that I'll be posted at Farafene military barracks. I was posted there. I was there for one month. I got called to say that I have to come back again to headquarters. I left the weekend and on Monday I reported to Fajara Barracks. So uh, I understand that throughout your career in the Gambia, you, um, you were a civil servant um, as well as um, in addition to your military career, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So after you returned to Gambia, and in August you were posted at Fajara Barracks, did you, um, were you given any other position um, later that year? Yes. After I returned from Farafene, I uh, received a call from the Ministry of Interior informing me that the then Minister Late Sadibu Haidara wanted to see me. So I went to Banjul, and that day coincided with the very day that uh, former Finance Minister Bibi Dabo came to join the, the government. And uh, I was told Sadibu Haidara and uh, former Vice Chairman Sana Sabali went to State House with uh, Bibi Dabo. And I had to wait until Sadibu came back in the afternoon. And that's when he informed me that uh, they have decided to post me, to transfer me to the police as commissioner of police. For how long did you remain as commissioner of police? As commissioner, I was promoted to commissioner of police on the 8th of December 1994. I remained in that position up till January. 1995 when I was arrested. Uh, um, a point of clarification, as Commissioner of Police, which, um, what was your portfolio? I was Commissioner of Police in charge of operations. So you remained in that position for um, just over one month and then you were arrested? More than, more than that, I think. Oh, yes, a and I was arrested, 1995, yeah. Can January, you January 1995, you're right. Can you tell us about your arrest? Okay, my arrest, I think I, if my memory serves me well, it was January 17, I'm not quite sure of the date, but it was the same day they arrested Sana Sabali and late Sadibu Haidara. Their arrest was in the morning while I was in my office at the police headquarters. And in the evening, usually when I close work, I will go to my mom at Hill Street. I was there till after eight. I left home and I was going back as on my routine round. At the junction Anglesey and Hagan, I met up with a a pickup or a van, military police officers, and ASP Musambub was among them. He was the one, in fact, leading them to my house. And Musambub told, told me, sir, we came for you. I told them, can you allow me? We go together to the police headquarters. I will park the car and surrender the keys, and we go. And uh, they did that. At that point, did they tell you why you were being arrested? I was not told why I was arrested. I left the car at the police headquarters and we went. They drove and took us. Of course, in the car, I met uh, my colleague, late 
ASP Valentine and some other army officers whom I did not, who I, I don't know really. Would that be Harry Valentine who you mentioned earlier? Harry Valentine was a police officer like me, but the military officers, I did not know them. And then we went to Yundum Barracks, which was very strange to me because police officers finding themselves in a military cell is very unusual. And also unusual is a police officer being arrested by a military officer. It can only happen in the Gambia. We were detained at the Yundum Barracks for one week, incommunicado. During that one week, did your family um, know where you were at all? My family had no clue of my whereabouts. Were you given access? I know you were held incommunicado, but I still have to ask a few questions. Mm -hmm. Were you given access to a lawyer, for instance? We were not given access, not in form of our right to have a lawyer. At, during those seven days, were you at any point told of the reason for your arrest? We were never told of the reasons of our arrest. Focusing still on those seven days at Yundum Barracks, can you tell us about um, the conditions of detention in terms of where you were kept, um, the type of food you had access to, as well as um, other facilities that you may have been given, if at all? We were given the, the, the military food they were cooking for the soldiers. Of course, the, 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 the conditions are, are not like what we have at home. It's, you just uh, lie on the floor with some blankets and that's it. We were, however, allowed to take shower. And after those seven days, can you tell us what happened? After those seven days, we were transferred to mile two at the Riman wing. When you arrived at mile two, were you told of the reason for your arrest? We were not told of the reason. I was not told of the reason of my arrest. Can you tell us how you were processed when you arrived at mile two? When we arrived at mile two at the Riman wing, uh, they just registered us, took our name, and uh, also kept our belongings, watches, bangles, or if you have money also, you have to hand it over to them. They will record it to the prison warders. And at this point, was it only you and um, Harry Valentine? No, it was myself, Harry Valentine, late Captain Musa Molo Balde, and some other soldiers. Who were arrested and transferred to mile two, or you met some of them at mile two? Some of them we were together at the cell in, uh, in Yundum, and we were transferred the same day to mile two, and we were in the same cell at the Riman wing, where uh, Captain Momodu Marong also joined us, and uh, additional soldiers later on were also sent to the remand wing and we were in the same cell. I think if my memory serves me well, uh, we were 10 in number in that cell. Can you tell us about the conditions of detention at mile two remand wing? Yeah, mile two remand wing, they, they had bunk beds with the plywood and a blanket, uh, only one blanket. So let's get this straight. They, you said bunk beds, but you've explained that there was plywood. What was the plywood resting on? The plywood was resting on, they built uh, with the blocks. So concrete. Yes, concrete, and, and then the plywood is on it. That's where you, you lie usually, with a blanket. At that point, you said there were 10 of you. Was there enough space in the cell for all of you to sleep? Yes, we had enough space, contrary to the other cells. And uh, of course, mm -hmm. in it you have the chamber pot, when uh, you have to do your personal admin at night, you have to use the chamber pot. I must say, 
of course, uh, is contrary to military ethics for senior officers to share the same cell with junior officers, but that was the situation. We have no, no other option. Nonetheless, the junior officers also were very respectful because they were the one uh, taking in the morning, they take out the chamber pots to empty them and wash them for us. And what about the other conditions um, at mile two? in terms of the food, um, ventilation, for example, were you allowed to go outside? Tell us about those. Yes, we were allowed to go outside. In the morning at 8 o'clock, they will come and open the cell, and uh, we were allowed to exercise. We will be from 8 to 12 outside, on and then the lunch will come. After the lunch, we take our lunch and get back into the cell. Of course, the food was not uh, as good as what we used to have at home. But the good thing is we were allowed provisions from our family members, like uh, corned beef, sardines, biscuits, and name it, but no food from home. And during that time, I'm still referring to, uh, let's say, the first few days um, or the first week at mile two, were you given access to a lawyer? We are not given access to, the, to a lawyer. Were you at any point in let's say the first few weeks informed of the reason for your arrest we are never informed of the reason of our arrest can you tell us for how long you were detained at mile two remand wing we were detained i was detained for 640 days at the remand wing with harry valentine captain mamadou marong but some of the soldiers were released before us. So roughly speaking, that would be um, under two years, let's yes, say. Yes, under two years, to few months less. Than two, two years. years. During that point, um, during that period of time, almost two years, were you charged at any point? We were never charged. Were you informed of the reason for your arrest? We were not informed of the reason of our arrest. Were you, did you ever appear before a court of law? Never appeared before any court of law. At any point during that period, um, were you questioned? One year after, January 1996, we were taken to the NIA before a panel chaired by former CMC Pahabi Bumbai. Can you tell us about that? Uh, the panel at the NIA was a, a, a mixed services panel. The one I can remember vividly is the chairman, Pahabi Bumbai, CMC, and uh, Chief Inspector Mambojang, who is now the Paramount Chief. The others were NIA officers, and most likely also some from the Army. And uh, during the interview, what they asked me is, what, the, what are my relationship with council members? And uh, where was I the day they were arresting former vice chairman Saidi Buhaydara and late uh, minister of interior? No, former vice chairman Sana Sabali and late interior minister Sadi Buhaydara. I told them the day of their arrest, I was at the police headquarters in my office. And what are your relationship with uh, council members? I told them the council members, the soldiers, Captain, no, Lieutenant Singate, Sana Sabali, and the others, I never knew them before. But uh, the chairman, Yaya Jame, he was my senior in the gendarmerie. And uh, late Minister of Interior Sadibu Haidara was my junior in the gendarmerie, and we attended the course together in Turkey. That was what I knew about them. 
Did they ask you any other questions as far as you recall? I, 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 I don't remember. Maybe they asked, but I don't remember the question that followed. And after they asked me to write a statement, which I did, and submitted to Mam Bojang. Um, but before that, still focusing on the types of questions you were asked, um, when they asked you those questions, where do you think they were going with that um, type of questioning? The, 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 the type of questions they were asking, uh, they were trying to link me up with whatever they accused the two, the vice chairman and the minister of interior. That was, that was their reading. intention. That was your reading of the situation? Yes, that was my reading of the, the situation. But they, did they at any point tell you why? They did not. You said that you were asked to write a statement. Mm -hmm. um, did you write your statement at the NIA that day? Yes, I wrote it at the NIA that day and submitted it to Mambo Yang. Do you recall if there was an independent witness present? There was no independent witness, as far as I can recollect. Can you tell us how that panel treated you during the time you spent the day? I, I, I must say they treated me with respect, to be quite honest. Did anything um, happen to you while you were at the NIA? Nothing happened to me while I was there. So you said this event took place um, a year into your detention? Yes. And thereafter, presumably, you were sent back to Mile 2 Remand Wing, is that yes, correct? Yes, we were back to Remand Wing. Um, let's focus a bit more on your family. During the time that you were at Mile 2, were you able to um, have family visits? Yes, my elder brother used to visit me. He was the one bringing the provisions for me. And how did it feel for you being, in, being at the Maltu Remand Wing for almost two years without being charged and not knowing what would happen to you essentially? Very frustrating. Tell us a bit more about that. Because normally if you arrest somebody, if not the same day, after 72 hours, you should be able to tell him or her the reason of his arrest and what uh, you found him wanting for, but that never happened. And you said after almost two years you were released. Please tell us about your release. How did that come about? We were released, but a few days before our release, we received a visit of the former Chief of Defense Staff, uh, Colonel Babukar Jata. <coughs> And uh, former Inspector General of Police, uh, Mr. Juf, I think is Suleiman, Jibril Juf, Jibril Juf. What we noticed while we were in detention, when you see these two people visit the inmates or the detainees, either at the maximum security or at the remand wing, few days or uh, some weeks after you have imminent release of detainees. And that what exactly happened after they left, after that visit, few days after, we, he, Colonel Bauka Jata came back, and uh, that's how we were released on the 28th of October, 1996. During those visits, including the one that finally led to your release, did they at any point um, tell you anything about either why you were there or um, what was expected of you um, if you were to be released? No, they will never tell you why you were there. They will just say we came to visit you and see how you are doing and yeah. Uh, did your conditions of detention improve following their visits? No, the conditions remain the same. <laughs> The only thing is that uh, you feel like uh, people at least out there are, are thinking of you by their presence on that very day, and that's it. After you were released, can you tell us about um, 
the impact that your detention had on you as well as your family? Of course, it was a big relief. That was the day we were really all praying for to at least uh, regain our freedom and join our, our families and our loved ones and friends. Uh, I was uh, really happy to be finally released and that uh, after so long, the government could not find anything against me. That was really a big source of happiness for me. And I, I really felt it for my mom. Please take your time, Mr. Baji. And just to remind you, you have a bottle of water right in front of you if you'd like to drink some water. She was a strong woman and definitely all those years she, she, she stood firm and continued praying for me and uh, I'll be forever grateful for her. After you, um, you were released, well, let me put it differently. Prior to your um, arrest and detention, you were the commissioner of police yes. for operations. Mm -hmm. Did you at any point um, receive a dismissal letter, for example? Yes. I, was, uh, I received a dismissal letter dated on the 16th of April, 1996, from the police informing me that uh, I'm dismissed from the Gambia police force with effect from 2nd February 1995. That sounds very unusual. And that was the situation. So essentially the dismissal letter came over a year after you were arrested and detained? Yes. And then backdated to yeah. a few days after your arrest? That's correct. And so apart from that letter, well, as a result of that letter, um, did you at any point receive any kind of benefits or um, salary from the police? Because when you are dismissed, you don't receive any benefits. But did you eventually receive some benefits or your salary? The salary stopped that very day. I'm sure they stopped it that very day based on the letter they had but which you only received a year and some months after. Yes, after I was reinstated and the letter was from the Ministry of Interior dated 19th November 1996. Tell us the contents of that letter. They said, in the interest of the service you are reinstated as Commissioner of Police Grade 12 with effect from 2nd February 1995. 1995, yes. So essentially nullifying your dismissal exactly. from the service. That is strange as well. So what happened after that? Did you receive any of your salaries or benefits um, from 95 yes. up until 96? I, I was paid the whole period of my detention. And uh, I went back to the police as commissioner of administration. So this time a slightly different portfolio? Yes. And for how long did you remain as commissioner of administration? I remain as commissioner of administration up to January 27, when I was appointed Minister of Interior. January 27th of which year? 1999. And for how long did you hold the position of Minister of Interior? I held the position of Minister of Interior up to 2003. 
Um, I have a, you gave me a copy of your appointment letter mm -hmm. um, when you were appointed as Minister of Interior. Yes. I will ask the usher to bring it back to you so okay. you can identify it. Okay. And thereafter, I would like to um, talk about your responsibilities as Minister of Interior at the time. Right. Thank you. Yes, that's my letter of appointment. And perhaps you can hold on to it um, okay. while we discuss um, your responsibilities as Minister of Interior. So you held that position for, um, from 1999 to 2003. Can you tell us what your responsibilities were? My responsibilities as stated in the letter were include a Conducting in cabinet and in the National Assembly business relating to matters within my portfolio. B. Putting into effect in collaboration with appropriate public officers and other secretaries of state the decisions taken in cabinet relating to such matters. C, initiating policy on all matters within my portfolio. And that is quite a general appointment letter. Yes. So I would like to talk a little bit more in concrete terms mm -hmm. what your um, responsibilities were mm -hmm. in, in actual fact. Mm -hmm. So let's focus on the issue of internal security. Yes. Can you tell us about your responsibilities as far as it concerns internal security? I think as far as internal security is concerned, uh, the responsibility lies mainly on the Inspector General of Police. At my level, it's only policy and of course the welfare of all those law enforcement agencies under the ministry. And when you say policy, what type of policy issues would that involve? Now, when we talk about policies, is uh, like uh, development policies of the police, the immigration, the fire and ambulance services, as well as the, 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 the prison services. Of course, expansion of police barracks in the country, police stations. It is the responsibility of the ministry to liaise with the Ministry of Finance and the local government to find land and also the funds to build those stations and of course the barracks for the families. We will also negotiate with our line counterpart ministries for the welfare of the, 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 the forces under the Department of State, for their canteen, uh, the feeding of the men and women in uniform. What about issues concerning weapons and ammunition? What was your role in relation to that as far as policies? send it to the ministry and uh, we in turn we will write to the ministry of finance for the purchase of the weapons that the police are requesting i'd still like to focus on um, the period in which you were minister of interior so from 1999 to 2003 mm -hmm. You mentioned that matters of internal security generally fall under the Inspector General of Police. That's right. Who did the Inspector General of Police report to? The Inspector General of Police can report both to the Minister and to the President of the Republic. What was uh, the standard practice in general? 
in general, only most of the time he will report to the, the, the Minister of Interior. But in other cases involving investigations, they lease more with the Department of State for Justice. But in your role as minister, you would be responsible for answering questions regarding the, the police as well. Yes, the I'll be responsible before the National Assembly for answering questions concerning the police. What about before the cabinet? Before cabinet as well. So essentially you were supervisor or boss of the IGP, so to speak. I will not say supervisor because the, the law did not say it, but I will say I was the mouthpiece of the police in the National Assembly and in Cabinet. So you would receive information from the Inspector General of Police concerning matters of internal security, That's correct, correct ma'am. Perhaps before we go further, can you give us an idea of the structure of the, um, the police force during that period? Oh, during Basic that structure. period, the, the, the organogram of the police force, you have the Inspector General of Police, the, the Deputy Inspector General of Police, two Commissioners of Police, one of Operations and the other one Administration. And then you have the Divisional uh, Commanders at the, in the seven administrative areas. Under them, you have the police stations. And on the other side, you have the police intervention unit, which, as a specialized unit of the police, is under the Inspector General of Police, but on operational matters to the Commissioner of Operations. Just to be clear, so the p police intervention unit on operational matters would refer to the commissioner of operations, which then, of course, would go to the IGP, right? That's correct, ma, because as a special unit, the police intervention unit cannot be deployed without the approval of the inspector general. And we will come back to that. I know that as Minister of Interior at the time, your portfolio went beyond the police. So it included other services. That's right. Perhaps it's good to just give us an idea of those, um, because my focus is really on the police. But let's have an idea of which other um, forces you were, well, units you were responsible for. Yes, other than the police, I was having the Gambia Immigration Department, the Fire and Ambulance Services, as it was called then and the prison services. So focusing still on the issue of internal security and the IGP reporting matters of internal security to you, because of course you've told us that you need to answer questions at cabinet as well as before the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. When it came to matters such as intelligence reports concerning um, issues that were happening in the country, that presumably is something you would have access to um, where it was necessary to, of course, inform cabinet or the National Assembly, correct? Yes, intelligence reports, we have the police CIU, Criminal Intelligence Unit, uh, which of course will make, do their findings, research, and uh, submit the report to the Inspector General of Police, who in turn will uh, also brief me on this situation. Can you tell us more about how those briefings were conducted? What format would they take and um, in which kind of instances would you receive such briefings? Those briefings are normally in the form of a meeting with the Inspector General of Police who will come and highlight the salient issues or the burning issues of the time. And uh, because some intelligence report is better not to leave copies, it should be verbal as well. And so you would receive these reports either in person um, through a briefing or reports? Correct? Yes, through a report. Perhaps focusing a little bit more on um, how that information flowed generally. Hypothetically speaking, if there was supposed to be instructions coming from either the, well, from any member of the cabinet, so 
any of the political appointees or the president himself, presumably based on what you've explained, that would go through you to get to the IGP? Yes, ma'am. That would be the normal course of events? That's right, ma'am. Okay. So perhaps let's go a bit more into um, the events of April 10 and 11th. Right. Um, but just before that, I think it would be a good idea to just get more about your career after you were Minister of Interior, mm -hmm. just so we know your entire progression, and then we'll come to the specific events of April 10 and 11. Yes, ma'am. After you, um, you left as Minister of Interior in 2003, what was um, the next position that you held in government? After I left in 2003, the government, uh, I uh, worked for the UN mission in Cote d'Ivoire. Up to 2005, I came back home. It coincided with the 2006 elections. And, uh, in 2007, I was appointed ambassador of the Gambia to Morocco. And for how long did you have that position? I remained in that position for five years, up to 2012, when I was uh, moved to France as ambassador of the Gambia as well. And for how long did you serve as ambassador, um, Gambian ambassador to France? I served for two years, 2012 to 2014. I was recalled and appointed Minister of Works and Infrastructure. And um, can you tell us which, day, um, which year, not the specific dates if you don't know, but which year you served as Minister of Works? I think I have my appointment letter, if you may allow, lead, Deputy Lead Council. Uh, yes, indeed, please refer to it. This was. Uh, no. I was appointed Minister of Works. In August 2014. And for how long did you hold that position? No, it was in August, sorry, in, on the 25th of August 2013. So you would have been ambassador to France from 2012 to 2013 then? Yes, to 2013. That's right, ma'am. So, Minister of Works from August 2013 until when? Until 13th of November 2014, when I was relieved of my appointment. After that, did you hold any other position in government? No, after that, I did not hold any position. That was the end of my public career, service career. So for the, for the bulk of your career within the civil service, you were either minister or an ambassador, correct? That's correct, no. So thank you for that information. We can go back to April 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. I would like to begin with the events leading up to um, April 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us um, what information you were aware of um, concerning uh, the issues surrounding the students' union at the time? The information I got from the police was that the students were planning to have a, a demonstration because of the two incidents that happened, one with the fire service who were having in their custody one student, Ibrahim Abari, if I may recall it, and uh, 
whatever treatment they subjected him to, according to them, led to his death. And as a result, the student body leadership were not happy with that situation. That's one. And the other information I receive is that uh, the PIU, while on duty at the Independent Stadium, an incident of rape was reported accusing one of the police intervention unit officers. So at the point that you received this information as Minister of Interior, these two incidents were being presumably investigated? Yes, by the according to the IG and of course to the chief fire officer, uh, they were seriously looking into the matter. But these matters came to your attention through a briefing by the IG, uh, by the police, That's who correct. in particular? That's correct, by the Inspector General, General of, of police. police. As a result of this information, um, do you recall having any meetings with members of the student leadership at the time? And I'm referring to Gamsu in particular. Meeting with members of the student leadership, I think I, we had a meeting at the Gambia College. Prior to the meeting at the Gambia College, do you recall meeting um, the president of Gamsu? No, that, the, the president of Gamsu, we met him well bef after, well after the meeting in, in, in the college. In, in which circumstances? He came. And uh, my secretary announced that uh, Mr. Omar Juf was here. He's the leader of the Gambia Student Union and wanted to see me. So let's take it chronologically. Let's start with the meeting that occurred at the Gambia College. Do you recall when that took place? I don't remember the date, but I know for sure that I was in that meeting with the Inspector General of Police, the Deputy Inspector General of Police, and uh, we met the, the, the principal of the college and uh, some other community leaders in Brikama. Can you tell us what the purpose of that meeting was? The whole purpose of the meeting was to reassure the parents of the two victims as well as the student body that uh, their concerns are well noted and taken care of. The police and the fire service are looking into the matter. You say to inform the parents of the two victims. This was in Brikama, I take it? Yes. At Gambia College. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of the fact that one of the victims doesn't reside in that area at all? I'm not aware. It, it's possible, but I'm not aware of it. But your intention was to go meet community leaders as well as the students yes. and reassure them about the steps that were being conducted. Because we were told that one of the victims was from Brikama, so that's why we decided to do so. So having said that the objective was to reassure the, um, the students as well as um, the families of those victims, mm -hmm. What was your, um, can you tell us how that meeting went? No, the, 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 of course the meeting, when you go to a meeting, the host is the first to welcome you. And uh, after welcoming you and introducing you to the audience, uh, they will ask you to take the floor, which I did as the head of the delegation. And I explained the purpose of uh, our presence there, and that we are here to reassure them that uh, these two matters are being handled by the right authorities, the two institutions, the fire service and the, the Gambia police force. And that, of course, that has to follow the due process. So they need to be patient and know that things will be done in accordance with procedures. How did the students receive that information, the student leaders? Yeah, it, it seems to, from my own observation, I think they, they were in a haste to expedite everything. But uh, uh, 
administration does not work that way, you have to go through procedures, especially when it involves death. You, that body has to be post-mortem to determine the cause of death. And uh, the post-mortem report is a very important document for the file docket. And uh, for the rape case, police have their, 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 they have their, their own procedures. You have to conduct an identification parade in the presence of the victim and her family where all those who were present, who were on duty that very day the, 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 the incident happened, will be paraded and the victim will go around all of them and identify the accused. I think that was done by the, the police authorities. We'll come to the details of those two cases later, but during the meeting with the students at Gambia College, did you at any point say anything to them about demonstrations? No, what, what I remember saying, telling them when they said, uh, when I had information that they were planning a demonstration, I told them, it's your right to demonstrate, but let this be within the confines of the law, because uh, the public order act said, if you want to plan a demonstration, you have to write to the Inspector General of Police and request for a permit. Why is that done? Uh, because you can never tell when you are planning a demonstration. Your intention, maybe it will be a peaceful demonstration, but you don't have control over who is joining that demonstration. So that's why writing to the police is very important. When they approve it, they will provide escort, police escort, and also they will determine the itinerary that the demonstrators are going to take. So as not to disrupt traffic, but also make sure that uh, some security aspects are taken into, care, uh, into consideration. How would you describe your tone and demeanor um, during that meeting? My tone was a normal tone, respectful tone. Of course, as responsible people, we, you don't expect us to leave our offices in Banjul, go up to Brikama and do, be rude or, or disrespectful to people. No, that, that, that's unthinkable. Well, let me give you some um, extracts of what, of what some of the witnesses have told the Commission about that particular meeting. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the um, witness we had, Mr. Alaji Estabo. Mm -hmm. And this is what he had to say about that meeting with you and the other um, heads of security. He had a meeting um, to threaten the... And in fact, during that meeting, he described the remarks as very harsh and threatening and he said in fact the students were warned that if anyone demonstrates again you will you well they will be dealt with according accordingly and the security of the country will not be compromised another witness mr lamin job had this to say about the same meeting he said it lasted less than 30 minutes and he said the tone of the IGP and the minister was aggressive, harsh and very intimidating. That Are you the, surprised to hear that? I am very surprised, Deputy Lead Council. That is their opinion and they are entitled to their opinion. I respect it. But it is my submission that the whole purpose was to reassure them and tell them that if they want to demonstrate, it's their right to do so, but also let us be within the law. They have to apply and get a permit. That's the right procedure. I don't remember having a harsh tone, and that's not my nature. The people who I work with in the Shandamori, the police, and as a minister, uh, will attest to that. 
But you would agree with me that communication is a two-way street, meaning what you communicate and how that message is received, correct? That's right. I agree with that. And so in this instance, you said your objective was to reassure but the feeling that we had from witnesses who were there was the complete opposite, which is a feeling that they were threatened and they felt intimidated. May I observe that Alaji, 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 Alaji S. Dabo, was he at the meeting? Yes. I don't think he was because in, according to his testimony, he said he came at the latter part. Yes, but he was still in a position to describe what he says was the tone of the meeting. Because that's what they wanted to portray. Not to tell people what their position was as well. But it is what do you our, mean my by submission. That? It what is do you my mean submission. By what do you mean by that? Because okay. we need to understand what you're yes. saying. You, you know, uh, communication, as you rightly put it, is a two way thing. If not, it will only be an information and not a communication. The students, when we arrived, we told them the reason and the purpose of our coming to the campus. And I already told you what the reasons were. And that uh, we wanted to reassure them that uh, everything is being taken care of according to law. But they insisted that they are going to demonstrate because they were not happy with the way or the, 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 the rhythm things were going. We thought maybe it's not for them to determine how the investigation should be carried out because those are rules already set and the procedures which the police have to follow. But if they want to demonstrate, it's their right. Uh, but, and even the Inspector General of Police, I think, uh, re echoed the same thing that uh, they have to write and the permit will be given. I, 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 I emphasize that. Write, request for a permit, and the IG will approve it. At that point, one of the statements that Elijah Estaba made was the warning was if anyone demonstrates again. At that point, when you had the meeting at Gambia College, had there been a demonstration prior to the meeting? Whether it happened days prior, before or not, was yes, there yes, a demonstration? Yes, I was told there was a demonstration, but around the fire service. What were you told about that particular incident? That the, some students gathered uh, around the fire service and were protesting uh, about uh, action not being taken against the fire officer uh, who's uh, been accused and uh, consequently I was told uh, they were throwing stones and uh, broke the windscreens of the fire tenders. Were you told were you told anything else about the conduct of the security forces um, during that during that particular no I, I did not I was never told of the conduct of the security forces during that uh, encounter or the meeting they had whatever are you aware of any specific orders that were given to either the fire service or the police intervention unit during that demonstration I was not aware of any specific order given to the fire service nor the police intervention unit so to be clear, you did not receive any kind of briefing about that particular, um, uh, about orders in relation to the, that particular demonstration? That's correct, ma. Okay. During that demonstration, are you aware of any, um, any deaths, for instance, or any um, injuries to the protesters? I've not received any report of the demonstration. Sorry, you did not receive any report about the demonstration? Yes. So the information that you have provided regarding the demonstration, where did it come from? The general it information was, it you It was given. a verbal telephone conversation when I was briefed that this is what happened. But there was no written report to clearly spell out what exactly happened, whether there were any injuries or casualties.
there was none. Only the damages that the fire service suffered. And indeed, that's the evidence that we have received, that none of the protesters were injured or none of them were killed. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us who gave you this, provided you with this briefing? I think the, the chief fire officer, the chief fire officer, Roger Bakurin, uh, gave me the information. So having gone, the demonstration occurred um, in Brikama. Mm -hmm. Nothing um, happened in terms of injuries and, um, and deaths. Mm -hmm. Then you had the meeting at Gambia College with the student, the student leaders as well as um, some other members of the community. Mm -hmm. After that, because you described the student leaders as wanting to just go ahead with demonstrations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you alluded to the fact that you've had meetings with Omar Juf, and those meetings came after, after the, the, college meeting. the college meeting. Right. Tell us about those meetings. Now, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but I was in my office when my secretary announced that Omar Juf was here and he wanted to meet me and I allow him in. So he was brought in and I, I listened to him. He said he was here to inform me that uh, he wrote a letter to the Inspector General of Police concerning the incidents of uh, the fire service in Brikama and the rape case in, uh, at the Independence Stadium. And uh, that uh, he wanted um, me to arrange a meeting with him and the Inspector General of Police to follow up on uh, actions and I called the IG, I told him that uh, the student leader is here, his name is Omar Juf and uh, he wanted to meet you because he had a letter they wrote to you but they are yet to get a response so IGP told me that it will be done. Do you recall how many times you met with Mr. Omar Juf? That was the only time I met with Omar Juf. Are you sure about that or? As far as more? I can recollect. It was that one meeting. So you had an opportunity to know who Omar Juf was because of that meeting, correct? Yes. We'll come back to that. You mentioned that after that meeting or during that meeting rather, you spoke to the IGP um, regarding the letter of demands and mm -hmm. he said he would look into that. Mm -hmm. After that, were you involved in any other meetings um, in relation to the student activities? No, that time? was the last. I, I, apart from the college meeting, I was not involved in any other meeting. Did you receive any information um, concerning the planned demonstrations? And I'm referring to the demonstrations that then took place on the 10th and 11th of April. The, the information I received was a verbal one telling me that uh, the students, they received strong intelligence report that the students are planning a demonstration on the 10th of April. And uh, that was all. Well, let's, let's be a bit more specific. When did you receive this verbal report concerning the demonstration? That was the Friday, I think, Friday before closing. And the demonstrations um, then took place on the Monday, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, who did you receive that verbal report? From the Inspector General of Police. Apart from the fact that it mentioned the occurrence or a demonstration that would occur on Monday. Mm -hmm. Did that report, um, the verbal report, did it contain any other information about um, the situation at the time or what was to be expected? No, it did not contain any other thing apart from the fact that uh, the IG said they did not receive any request for a permit. So the focus was on the permit and the fact that a demonstration would occur. But more specifically, are you aware of any kind of security risk assessment being conducted um, in preparation for the demonstration? I was never informed of any security assessment risk being conducted in prelude to the demonstration. 
would that be something that would normally occur as far as you're aware? Have you seen any kind of security risk assessments um, in, re in relation to events such as those? Under normal circumstances, the criminal intelligence unit normally, uh, they will do that security risk assessment and provide it to the inspector general of police who in turn will share it with his management team. That's normally the, 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 the procedure. Throughout your period, um, your time as Minister of Interior, did you ever see any security risk assessment report? No, no, no. I, normally those ones, I, 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 I don't receive them as a minister. I have not, I have not received the security risk assessment. So are you assuming that it's something that happens or you've been informed that security risk assessments are conducted? I was told about the imminent demonstration of the students, but whether they have any intelligence report to that effect, I think the IG is the only one who can answer that question. So to be clear, you never received an intelligence report? That's right, Deputy Lead Counsel. So neither verbally nor in writing? That's correct. So after the IGP told you about the demonstrations that would occur, did he give you any other information about any plans that they had in place? No further information. Did you take any steps as a result of the information that you received? As a result of the information I received, I sent a press release from the ministry, which was broadcast on uh, GRTS, uh, that uh, we are aware of an imminent demonstration by the students. And uh, according to information we received, that information uh, that demonstration, if it goes as planned, will be illegal because there was no permit. And that was a press release that came from your office, correct? Yes, indeed. It came from my office. Do you recall when that was broadcasted it on GRTS? It was broadcast on the 9th, a day before. So press release 9th of um, April, the day before the actual um, demonstration. On that same day, did you receive any information about any planned meetings between the student leaderships and any member of your cabinet? I did not receive any, any information concerning a planned meeting between the student leadership and uh, any authority in government. So specifically, you were not aware of a planned meeting between the student leadership and the vice president of the Gambia at the time? That's correct, Deputy Lead Counsel. And so on that Sunday, did you receive any other information about any plans that were in place to deal with the student demonstration? I did not receive any plan uh, as to how they were going to deal with the student demonstration. So let's talk about what happened the next day, that is the 10th of April. Can you tell us what, ha um, what type of information you received um, as a result of the demonstration? Or more specifically, when did you first become aware of the events of that day? No, that very day I, I, I did not receive any information. I left my house at 7.30 a.m. and uh, going to the office, of course. and. Uh, Upon arrival at Just a second, may I just interrupt you? Yeah. Did you speak to anyone on the telephone during that period about um, the demonstrations? I, I was not even having my telephone that day. I did not speak to anybody. Can you clarify that? What do you mean by you did not have your telephone? Were you in possession of a mobile phone at that, per at that point in time? I had a mobile phone, but that particular day, I, I, I must have forgotten it at home. So I went out and I realized that when I was uh, around GTTI that I did not have my phone. 
But prior to leaving your house, you said you left your home at 7.30. Mm -hmm. Did you receive any phone call from anyone regarding the demonstrations that were unfolding that I, day? I, I, can't, I don't remember receiving any call that day from anybody about the demonstration. And so you left your house mm -hmm. intending to go to work, is that yes, correct? Yes, yes. Can you tell us about, um, about that journey to work? Yes, I arrived at GTTI, it was a quarter to eight in the morning, and uh, I found the situation somehow chaotic because traffic was not moving. The students were chanting, release our leaders, and on the ground I found Less than 10 police officers, they were outnumbered by the students. And the situation was such that I have to alight from my vehicle and uh, move towards the students. And can you describe that situation um, that you're talking about? You mentioned, um, obviously, vehicles yes. um, being stopped, but what was it about um, the situation that made you alight from your vehicle? Be what did because, you observe? Because I think as a result of that, the, the, the students were not happy, but then I did not know the reason for them being not, not being happy. What about their um, demeanor or their behavior made you conclude that they were not happy? No, it's through their, their reaction and the way they were chanting. But I must say they were not in any way violent as well. At that point, you said you noticed less than 10 PIU officers. Mm -hmm. What were they doing when you saw them? They, they were trying to disperse the, the students not to be in the, in the road. And um, can you describe for us what you observed? How were they trying to do that? They were, were trying as usual, as, uh, as they normally do when they are in such situations, trying to push them uh, to at least get them go back into their school. Can you describe for us, because we were not present, can you mm -hmm. describe for us how they were trying to push them? to use their truncheons and, and the shields they had and ask them to move and get back into the school to free the traffic. So at that point, the PIU officers were forcefully pushing the students backwards using their equipment, is that that's, correct? That's correct, and that's the time I arrived. I alighted from my vehicle and went straight to the students. In fact, when the PIU officers saw me, they stopped whatever they were doing. And then I asked these students, what can I do to help defuse the tension? They gave me two demands. One is they don't want to see any police presence near them. Two, they want the release of their leaders detained at the police intervention headquarters. I told them, consider it done, and I turned around and asked the security forces or the, the, the police officers on the ground to disperse. And I made this gesture, go, get out of this place, and I waited five minutes to make sure that the orders are executed, which they did. So to be clear, those were orders that you issued to members of the PIU, and your orders were complied with? They were complied with. So you essentially had um, authority and command to do that at that point in time, correct? To defuse the tension, I did it and it was done. And they complied? They complied. So after five minutes, what happened? After five minutes, I went, I drove to the police intervention unit where the student leaders were detained. And I think in that process, some of the students from GTTI followed me. They wanted to be sure that their leaders are released. Upon arrival at the police intervention unit, the only 
police officers I found there were a few, maybe one or two or three, I don't know, I don't remember exactly, who were guarding the detained students. And I instructed them to release the leaders they have with them, which they did. You told us that you arrived at GTTI around quarter to eight. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. And you had a discussion with the students. Mm -hmm. You ordered the soldiers to dis um, the PIU officers to disperse, mm -hmm. and they did. You waited five minutes. Mm -hmm. So presumably by the time you got to the PIU headquarters, it would have still been around eight. Is that correct? Yes, eight that's in the correct. morning. That's correct, Deputy Lead. You said upon arrival, you only saw two or three PIU officers who were guarding the students. That's right, as far as I can remember. So there were no other PIU officers there, there as was, far that, as that, you... that place was empty. They were all deployed. I don't know where they were deployed, but there was none other than those ones I'm telling you. And um, I believe we should end it there because it's time for the break, but we will continue when we come back from a 30-minute break um, and then continue hearing from you about what happened. Right. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, it's now time for the break, so I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Mr. Baji. We will take a 30-minute break and resume at uh, 12 noon sharp. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. I'm <laughs> Why mona next aduna bi? Mona la yone ndu. Sinu kau. Te amu ben jefe jefe. Amu ne rebi de fo po. Te kwalen. 